All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew chapter 16 with me this morning, please. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. I hope you have in your hands a Bible that you believe. Amen. Don't ever let man mess you up in your faith in God's eternal word. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, this is in the north now, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now we have direct revelation from God. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Quite a remarkable thing, don't you think? Yes, sir. Now, I want you to look at verse number 21. Same chapter. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, hold on when you read what follows. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Father, bless your word now. In your holy name, amen. There's a lot of things in this chapter. One has to do with the revelation of Christ, who he is. It comes from the Father comes from the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The other has to do with why he was here. What's this all about? He said he had to go to Jerusalem and die. No doubt Peter, in his own estimation, his own understanding, he meant well. He said to him, how can this be? You are sent to teach us and lead us and to pull this country out of uh, Roman oppression and be our Mashiach. And now how in the world is this going to happen with you going to the cross? And of course you understand that we cannot lean to our own understanding but we absolutely are dependent upon God to teach us and lead us and guide us by the Holy Spirit of God. So what happens here is a direct confrontation that is quite a thing, and I'm going to call your attention to it because it's very important. If you look back, he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. God has blessed thee. He's given thee wisdom. He's given thee a revelation. You didn't get that from man. You got that from God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then he turns right around and says to the same Simon Barjona, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Thou savest the things that are, that are not of God, but of men. So what he's saying to us this morning, and this is important to grasp this, is that even though you don't get any closer than Simon Peter got to him, with any greater revelation than what he had, and I mean this is at the top, yet he could be possessed by Satan. Now, the possession is not the same. I want to try to define what I'm talking about and get a hold of something that makes sense for us. And here's the question. Can a Christian be demon-possessed? Now, you hear this asked all the time. And people legitimately ask a question like that because of, the, because of the behavior that they see people go through, so forth and so on. But I want you to understand something. The Bible speaks to issues if we just read it, pray over it, and let God give us some understanding. Now, he said, Satan, get thee hence. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was speaking directly to Peter. He may very well have been speaking to Satan that had come into Peter's mind. And he was speaking to the spirit being. I'm not saying that, that Peter himself had become Satan. No way under the sun. What we have here is a believer that can be influenced by the wrong spirit. That's what's going on here. That's, what the, that's how you understand what we're reading. That Bible talks about Christ as the prophet, priest, and king. Amen.
It talks about him as the good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. And we talked about that this past Wednesday night. As the good shepherd, he sacrifices himself for us. As the great shepherd, he ministers to us through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And then as the chief shepherd, he rules over his flock. So therefore, he is the good shepherd here in the book of Matthew chapter number 16. I have come to lay down my life and, and, and to fulfill the prophecy of the scripture which came cannot be broken. And sometimes my disciples get in the way. And sometimes I must move them with understanding from God. In the Old Testament, he's called the suffering Messiah, but he's also called the reigning Messiah. This is something that the Jew deals with today. The, sulfur, the uh, Mashiach von uh, uh, David and Mashiach Joseph. Joseph is the suffering Messiah. David is the reigning Messiah. There is the pre-incarnate Christ that we find in the Old Testament. Then there is the incarnate Christ as he became man, as God crossed a threshold that he could never cross again. Once he had crossed that threshold and had become a man, there will never be a time when he unbecomes a man. For the Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man forever and ever and ever. That's something to take home and think about. And my friend, he's the coming one. John chapter 14, he said, if I go, I will come again to receive into myself that where I am there you may be also. The burden of scripture is to give us the second coming of Christ, but it comes in stages. You hear a lot of talk now, you see a lot on television about the rapture of the church of God. I hope they're right with all of my heart and all of my soul. Before I finish this message this morning, the greatest thing that could happen for any of us is to hear a shout that says, come up hither and meet him in the clouds and in the air. Amen. I look for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I've only touched on a few things that are in the Holy Bible. But here's the point of my message this morning. This Bible is about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read this Bible and Christ is not all over the pages of the Bible, you're reading something that is not the Scripture and the Word of God. You're reading, you are being led by a spirit into the Bible and you're cherry picking the Bible and you're not reading it in the context context of why it was given. Read the scriptures. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. That is from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. So the Bible, if you are being led by the Holy Spirit of God, will come alive to you in ways that it never had before. For you'll find him in typology on the pages of the Bible. You'll find him in prophecy on the pages of the Bible. You'll find him in presence in the Old Testament in a manner that you can't even imagine in the pages of the Bible and you'll, you'll go away from the Bible saying to yourself, my, what a precious, blessed book it is. So let's talk about something that's important for us to understand about who we are. And that is the two natures. If you are born again, you have two natures. If you are not born again, you have one nature. Can an unsaved man therefore be demon possessed? His soul can be possessed of the devil. His mind can be possessed of the devil. And his body can be possessed of the devil. He can be completely and absolutely possessed by the powers of hell. An unsaved man has no weapon against Satan. He has nothing to refer to to stop the devil from sifting him as he pleases, to take him captive, to take him at snare as he pleases. An unsaved man has no power whatsoever over Satan. But you've got to remember this. When God saved your soul, you are now two part. He says in the book of Romans chapter number seven, for we know the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I will allow not. For what I would, that do I, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, now watch him in parenthesis, define himself. He said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now watch carefully the apostle. So with the mind I serve the law of God. 
but with the flesh, the law of sin. The apostle is making it very clear to every one of us in this house today, including this preacher, that if you're born again, there's two parts to you. There's the old man and the new man. So for you to say that a Christian cannot be possessed of the devil, that which is born of the Spirit of God certainly cannot. No way under the sun. Paul, uh, John makes it very clear in the book of 1 John, that which is born of the Spirit can not sin. It is an utter impossibility. But on the other hand, a mind which is the workhouse of the soul. That is where you do your thinking. The mind is the workhouse of the soul. It's where you make decisions. You make choices. You do this and you do that in the mind. The Bible teaches that the saved man still has a twofold mind. This is why it tells you, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells you that by the renewing of your mind, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The mind is a clearing house. It's a battlefield. And it's something that you deal with every day of your life. If you allow that mind to my friend to drift off into the power of Satan, you can believe me that he will possess that mind. I don't care how saved you are. He can possess the mind of the soul. And when he does that, then the battle begins to rage. This is why the scripture teaches that that soul can be saved and it is saved. But it takes the power of the Holy Spirit of God by the intercession of Christ at the right hand of the Father to continually save that soul throughout this life on this earth. Are you following me? Well, you say, preacher, does that mean that the soul of a saved man can be lost? No. What happens if the soul of a saved man does not yield in obedience to the power of the Holy Spirit of God? It will lead you to death. That's what happens to the saved man, but he will never lose his salvation. So remember this. It's very important. In the book of Acts chapter number 5 and verse number 1, we get into a situation I think that will illustrate what I'm saying. There was a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife. They sold a possession. And they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath now what? Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. Were these two saved people? I believe they were. I believe they were part of the new church. They were part of what was happening in the first part of the book of Acts. But you see, they had yielded to greed. That's the old man. That's the old man. You say, well, I don't have any greed. Don't kid yourself. I'm not going to jump ahead of myself. But just hold on until we get to the end of this message today. Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You see, the reason they died is because they had committed being saved a sin unto death. And you can do that. If you be in sin without chastisement, the apostle says in Hebrews chapter number 12. And some of you may be living a very godless, sinful life today. And you may have been drugged into this church this morning. Or they may have drugged you to, uh, to, the, to the television set to watch it or whatever. And you have no desire to be here. You don't care anything about the word of God. And you go right back to your godless life when you leave out of this house today. And yet nothing seems to bother your soul. For my dear friend, for 27 years until 1973, my friend, I lived in hell. I practiced sin. I lived in sin. I was a sinner from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Now listen to me. I never one time was convicted of anything I ever did. I enjoyed what I did. Day in and day out, I lived in sin. That was who I was. There was no conviction from God. Why? Because I was lost. That's why. And this is the problem. There's so many people that go to the house of God and they're living like that. And yet there's somebody they sat on somebody's knee when they were four and they led them to the Lord or they had water sprinkled on them and they were made a Christian, quote unquote. And yet their life has never changed. Until 1973, I lived a godless, profligate life. My friend, I was ungodly, ungodly. I was lost without God. I want you to understand that today. These churches people go to today, they make you feel good in your sin. They, they teach you how to explain it away. They teach you how to spin it. They teach you all kinds of stuff. 
But in 1973, I bowed my head and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I mean, I was convicted of my sin. I cried out to God to save my soul. And do you know what happened to me that day? I changed immediately. I didn't change myself. He changed me. Then, then I began to feel something inside me that wasn't in there before. Yes, I began to feel conviction that I never had before. The thing, my dear friend, that I did and know with no conviction didn't bother me one bit. If I, if I faltered or drifted back into some of that stuff, I mean to tell you my heart began to burn within me. Something was coming down on my heart. I was convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That is proof positive that you're saved. Amen. But if you could go right back to the same hell hole you came out of and there is no conviction and no, my dear friend, make no mistake about it, and no chastisement from God, you're still as lost as you were. I don't care if you belong to every church in Tennessee, you're just as lost as you were. And this is, message is for you, I pray. And it's also for the saved. So the Bible says, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? So Satan can fill the heart of the believer. He can speak through your mouth as he did Peter. Remember, God spoke directly to Peter. You say, well, Satan wouldn't do me like that. He'll do what he can to you. Amen. The Bible said in Galatians chapter number five, verse 16, that I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's a battle going on. It rages. There is never a peace. There is never, my dear friend, never, 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 never. One over the other. One will be controlling your mind. Which one is controlling your mind? Your mind will drift. As I've said before, your mind has a mind of its own. And the only way it can be controlled is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So let's check our spirit. This is where the power lies. The power is completely and totally and absolutely in the spirit. Sure, you've tried to do better. Sure, some of you felt, felt bad. Maybe you saw the consequences of the kind of life you're living. Maybe you came home drunk and your wife was crying and your, chi and your children were hungry. Maybe you realize that the sin that you're committing is causing death about those that you love. Maybe it's beginning to affect you. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because that's where God begins to wake you up. But the spirit is all important. The power of your flesh, the power of your determination, the power of your will will get you nowhere. It takes the spirit of the living God to break the power of sin. The Bible said in 1 John chapter number 4 and verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Now watch carefully. You might want to turn to this one because this is a very important scripture. And watch what happens when you read this. See if it jumps off of the page and gets a hold of you. In 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every man that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now how many caught me? You see, you just assumed that's what it's saying. That's not what it said. Look at it again and read it carefully. Every Spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So what does that mean? Does that mean that I've got a bunch of spirits lined up over here and I go from one to the next to the next to the next and see what they confess about? No, 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 no. You're talking to a man or a woman, but you're talking to the spirit in that man or that woman. That's where the communication takes place. The spirit. Why? Why? Because that's the life. The body without the flood, without the spirit is dead. Spirit is everything. That's the life. And if there is no spirit there, there is no life there. If there's no Holy Spirit there, there's no life there. And the spirit is who you're talking to. The spirit is what animates you today. The spirit that speaks forth from inside you is what you are. That's who you are. And he says, try the spirit. So therefore you talk to the spirit. Well, you talk to this individual. Sure you are. But you know that there's something deeper than the flesh that you're talking to. That's the key to this text, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, greats the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. What a wonderful text. 
But some of these new Bibles say, he who was manifest in the flesh. The apostle John told us that you try the spirit by the fact that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and ever since that he can come in the flesh. God has incarnated himself in flesh. Jesus Christ is God incarnate in flesh. Why would they want to change that? Why would they do that? You say, well, the Greek, what are you talking about, the Greek? All you got to do is get Nestle Allen's critical apparatus and you can see every single word in the New Testament. You can see the scriptural authority. You can see the historical authority. You can see the authority for every single word. They don't give you that. You're not going to get that. You're, what you're going to get is their agenda as they kind of lead you and point you away. I have never found one reason for denying God was manifest in the flesh. That book you've got in your hand, I hope that's what it says. In John chapter 16, verse 8, And when he has come, he will prove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. There is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Note carefully, when he comes, he will talk about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God will take the Bible and he'll make everything that is in this Bible relate to the Lord Jesus Christ one way or another. Amen. Amen. That's how you know that it's the Holy Spirit of God. You say, well, now, preacher, they don't talk about the Lord in our church. They talk about the ministry in our church. They talk about the great visions that our church has. They talk about how you are so important in the sight of God. They, when we come to our church, we leave, we feel good. Preacher, I feel so good. Oh, I feel so good. I feel good about myself. Why, I'd never imagined I was so wonderful and great until I heard the preacher preach, and he told me how wonderful I was. You've been lied to. <laughs> I'll ask your husband or your wife or your children how wonderful you are. Yeah. Or that man or woman you work with and they'll tell me how wonderful you are. I'm not wonderful. I'm not Mr. Wonderful. There's only one Mr. Wonderful. Amen. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you like to glorify him? Do you want to exalt him? Does he excite you? Do you look in the Bible when you pray over the scripture? Do you say, Lord God, show me Christ in this book. The old timers used to say that. They said, Lord, show me the Lord Jesus in this. And he's in it. <laughs> he's in places you never thought he'd be. Why? Because it testifies of him. The Bible said in John 16, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he shall glorify me. And me, of course, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Glorify him. How do you glorify the son of God? Well, you preach the power of God and the salvation for one thing. You preach to men that they're sinners and that they need to be born again. And the only way they can be born again is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not do good. It's not turn over a new leaf. It's not keep the commandments. It's not do the best you can. That'll do nothing for your soul. You must be born again. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Hebrews 9 says, chapter 5 says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Perfect. You mean he was imperfect? No. Perfection has to do with the fact that he, God was incarnate in flesh and through every sense that that incarnation would affect God Almighty be incarnate, it was perfected. It was brought to the place of consummation. It was brought to the place to where he was ready to minister for every one of us at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he's able to save to the uttermost all that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. When God saved you, he saved you for the rest of your life. Amen. That salvation is a perfect salvation. It's a pure salvation, a complete salvation. It's the salvation of the Lord because he's the author of it. He was not the author of your eternal salvation until he became incarnate and lived a sinless life on this earth. He went through everything we go through, felt everything we feel, saw all the sorrow we had, the pain, the hunger. God never hurt for anything before the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. God Almighty was never hungry one time before the Son of God came into this world. God Almighty never felt pain the first time until the Son of God came into this world. And then when he did, he felt your pain. He felt your hunger. He feels your sorrow. And therefore, he's able to minister what needs to be ministered because of that. That, my dear friend, is what the great shepherd is doing right now at the right hand of the Father. He will preach the finished work of Christ, Hebrews 10, 12, by this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Amen.
Why did he sit down? Because the work was done. It was finished. You don't have to keep offering him up every week. You don't have to keep, keep giving people a wafer and wine every week to keep them saved. One time he died, one time you're born again, and that sticks for eternity. Amen. One time. Amen. Amen. He'll preach the utter glorification of the Son of God. Romans, Revelation 1.13. We see him in his beauty. Is the Lord Jesus beautiful? It depends on what you call beauty. I believe he's beautiful in every sense of because it's the beauty of holiness. What does that mean? That means that for every imperfection of us, he's perfect. That means for all our failures, he succeeded. That means that we are condemned. He won at the cross at Calvary. He said it's finished and did what my friend only he can do. And so in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul, you came to that conclusion. Luke 24, 27, and beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So how do we live for God? How do you live for him? How do you live for him? This is probably the most important part of the message this morning. How do you live for God? How do you do it? I've been studying the Bible 50 years, folks. 50 years. I've learned certain things in the last two or three years it took me 47, 48 years to get to. That's the truth. I'm learning them, though, and I'm still learning. I'm learning. I'm like, I'm like a kid in first grade. My eyes are wide open, and I've got my Bible open, and I say, Lord, teach me. I want to learn. Amen. Amen. So how do you? Well, I'm going to tell you what, tell you again. How many of you have a good memory? How many of you remember 1 John chapter number 1, verses 8, 9, and 10 being preached? How many times have you heard it preached? Church I came out of where I was saved? Maybe once or twice. And the application was completely different from what the text has to do with here. They don't preach it. Do you know why they don't preach it? Because it attacks their pride and their self-righteousness. Now, I want to give you this, and we'll come to a close this morning. But this is so important. Fellowship is how you live for God. Amen. Fellowship. That's how you do it. You agree that you cannot completely search your own soul. I don't know how many people have said to me, Preacher, if I know my heart... There's nothing between me and the Lord. But the problem is you don't know your heart. The Bible is, says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Here was David's prayer in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. When he killed Uriah, he was not a man after God's own heart. When he gave him that thing to, to carry into his own death warrant into the battlefield, he was not a man after God's own heart. When he took Bathsheba and lay with her and bore a child by her, he was not a man after God's own heart. But there is no man in that Old Testament. And if you'll read Psalm 51 and read it closely, there's not one that even comes close to explaining what it means to get right with God but David. That is the, that is, that is the greatest declaration in Scripture about how to get right with God. That's got to be, in my estimation, a man after God's own heart. In plain words, he shows you how to get right with God. Oh, would you hear me? Are you listening to me? Are you listening? I don't know how many times I quit before I got up to preach this morning. Man, we've been going through the hardest time that I've ever been in the ministry. I don't want your pity. I want your prayer. Amen. This hadn't been easy. It hadn't been easy, believe me. But I know who I trust. Amen. And I get to a point to where I say, now Lord, the only thing I really have left is that I still trust you. Amen. I still believe in you. Amen. And I'm not gonna leave you. Amen. Die or whatever. I'm not gonna give up on you. Amen. I don't understand a lot of the stuff. But he doesn't require me to understand a lot of the stuff. Have you prayed like that? Really? Come out, of your, come out of your bubble. Have you really poured your heart out to God? And said, Lord, there's a lot going on at that church. There is. The forces of hell have come against Temple Baptist Church. 
There are elements out there right now that are trying to rip this church apart and they're trying to destroy my testimony of 47 years. I've lived before you people. They attack my integrity. They say, pack it with lies and they've said these things. Why do I say this? I say this because you need to understand. We're not as big as we used to be. But that's not what's important. He's all big as he used to be. He's still as big as he's always been. You see, I have learned to preach. And I, folks, how many thousands of times have I preached? But I am learning to preach in the most difficult circumstances that I've ever preached in my life. And I'm learning something about God. Does that help you? When you go to, through times in your life when you have to, you have to continue to live for the Lord and, and you want to serve Him and yet, you know, it hurts and you don't know what to do, just stick with Him. Amen. Listen to Him. Walk with Him. Make Him your soul, your life. Love Him. And that's what I do because I quit twice before I preached this morning. I said, ain't no way I can get up there and preach. I was ready yesterday for two days, ready to preach. And last night, no, I'm not. I'm not going to preach. Got up this morning, ready to preach. No, I'm not. I'm not going to preach. And then finally I said, Lord God, I did. I said this to him. I said, give me a sword and put it in my hand. Give me a sword and put it in my hand. I'll go down fighting Amen. I'll go down with a sword in my hand. Amen. Amen. And Red Blue used to get up here and sing, I die on the battlefield. Let me die on the battlefield. Am I helping you? How many of you are in that place right now? You know it. Everybody's not on the mountain shouting, praise. If you're on the mountain shouting, praise God, shout on. Amen. I'll get up there with you as soon as I can. But right now you may be in a valley. You may be going down into one. You may be seeing it unfold before your very eyes. You may be witnessing the power of Satan. And I had never really witnessed the power of Satan like I have. This is the hardest time I've ever been in my life. So what am I going to do? Quit? Tuck my tail and run? No! Give me the sword! And I'll die on the battlefield. You cannot search your own soul. You can't do it. And so God allows you to come into situations where he shows you how to search your soul. How does he do that? He brings, you, he brings circumstances into your life to open up the hidden things in your life and in your soul that you didn't even know were there, but you'd never know it until he brought you to a situation to where you began to see it. For example, like the trial that I'm going through now. I know what's in my soul. I know what I'm made of. I know who I am. What's in my life right now? What's, it, what's what he's tried to, he has brought me to where I have said, yes, there's nothing left. There's nowhere to go. I'm not turning loose of you. I don't under, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm gonna take hold of you. If I go down, I go down taking a hold of you. I go down holding you. I'm not gonna turn loose. I'm a hold of you. And so I, that was in here, but I didn't know it till I was brought to the gates of hell. But it's in there. It's in there, brother, and you can't take it away from me. I've been here. I've been there. And the second thing are the sins. Sins will come up in your life you didn't imagine were there. You thought you had it all whipped, but you didn't realize that all you need is the right situation and circumstance to reveal sin in your life in a way that you never do it. There's some kind of an emergency going on back there. Pray for them. I don't know what's going on. Pray for them. Might need to call an ambulance or something. Okay, yeah, I don't... I don't whatever's going on. I don't know who it is, but pray for them, folks. Lord, help them, whoever this is back here. Whatever their need is, I don't know what's happening. But we, God bless them. We, wish, we, want them to, we want them to get through this. I don't know what's going on. They've called 911. Okay. Get them over here as fast as they can. Yeah. Get, get them in here. They having a heart attack? All right. Okay. Well, folks, let's just call an end to it, okay? I mean, you've got a situation like this. I can't, you know, I've preached enough. There's more here, but I, we'll take care of it later. Y'all come down. Let's pray for this, okay? I don't know who this is back here, but let's just come down and pray for them. We want them to get help. 
Amen. We want them to get help. Get 9-1, get the 911, get the ambulance out here as fast as you can and, and help this dear soul. I don't know what's going on, but let's, Father, Lord, help them get through this. Now, I don't know what it is. I have no idea. I don't even know who it is, but Father, you do. And we pray for them right now, Heavenly Father. You, you can touch this body. I don't know what the issue is. I have no idea. I don't know a thing. But Father, get the ambulance here, Lord, and pick them up and be able to take them and do what needs to be done to help them. We pray for them, Father. We pray for them, Lord Jesus. We pray you'd bless them now. We pray you'd lift them up. God, we pray them. Put them in your hands, Holy One. You make no mistakes, Lord. We pray for healing, Father. And pray for the family, for all that know this dear soul here, Father. They may, may have some family members here. I don't know anything, Lord. Don't know anything. But we pray for the family. If they're here, we pray for the family, wherever they may be. We pray for them. We pray for them. In Jesus' name.